Okay, so welcome everybody to the third day of the NFCore Hackathon. Today we have an invited speaker, Ellen Cronander from SciLife Lab and the National Bioinformatics Infrastructure in Sweden. And she will tell us about data management solutions. So welcome Ellen, thank you for giving a talk here and stage is yours. Thank you, uh, I'm really happy to be here today and talk to you um, about data management solutions. So just a brief uh, background. Um, I have a background in biomedicine and did a PhD in neuroscience at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland. I then took a little break from academia and joined a startup uh, working with e-learning kid for kids. But since earlier this year, I'm back in Sweden and I work as a data steward at Envis. So Envis is the national bioinformatics infrastructure in Sweden. And it's a consortium between major universities in Sweden and we're distributed over uh, six different locations. We also make up the bioinformatics platform of SciLife Lab. And we have three main uh, activities. Um, so there's a lot of analysis experts that provide support and engage in um, different projects, both in short and long term. And um, we also meet some infrastructure needs by developing tools as a support service, but also in European and Nordic collaborations. NBIS also offers training and workshops within the area of bioinformatics for the life science community uh, across Sweden. NBIS is also coordinating the Swedish Elixir hub and Elixir is the European infrastructure for bioinformatics. And we are a small but growing data management team that is working across all these uh, activities. And uh, both Envis and Elixir is committed to the principles of fair research data. And that means that we are promoting that data should be easily accessed, understood and exchanged and reused. And the fair principles are a fundamental part of open science and describe uh, some of the central guidelines to good data management. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about that first. So FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And uh, for data to be useful for others, it should be FAIR. And uh, in 2016, 15 principles uh, were published, and they have since then received worldwide recognition and been adopted um, by many large um, Funding, funding agencies and uh, organizations like the European Union, for example. Um, so these 15 principles map onto the four uh, fair categor categories. And the idea is that by following the principles, you ensure that your data is fair. This is um, a nice picture from AS. Um, Australian National Data Service, where you can see all the principles. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want us to look uh, at a few. So uh, in the first row, to make your uh, data findable, persistent identifiers is something that is very useful. And this is a unique identifier that should ideally be globally unique. And an example of um, a PID is uh, DOI, that we heard that each of the NFCore pipelines, each version has their own DOI. So it's easy to, um, to, to find the right one. And then uh, it also says that you should provide rich metadata. So metadata is the data about data and the more metadata you can provide, the easier it will be to both find and reuse uh, the data. And all the principles that somehow touch upon metadata um, 
are here labeled in yellow. So you can see that the yellow squares are actually uh, showing up in, in many places. So metadata is something that's really important. So for accessible, um, I want to point out that accessible is not the same uh, as open. So we want people to have access to the data if it's possible. So as open as possible, but as closed or restricted as necessary. So there are sometimes good reasons why data cannot be made open. Um, it can be privacy concerns or maybe some commercial interest. But even if it cannot be open, we want it to be possible to find it and for people to know how to access it, how to ask permission um, to access it and so on. So the last thing I want to point out here is usage licenses, because I think this is uh, important and sometimes overlooked. So if you have found data, you have accessed it, it's interoperable, so you can do a new analysis, for example, with it, but there's no license, so you don't know what you're allowed to do with the data, and then you can't really reuse it anyway. So, um, it's a very important uh, thing to also um, attach a license to your data. So when you look at all these principles, it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, how can you make sure that your data is fair? And there is a shortcut to this, or at least uh, a way to, to get toward fairness relatively easy. And that is um, by using public repositories or international repositories to, to publish your data. Because many large international repositories strive to be fair and they will then handle uh, some of the things for you. For example, they will make you provide domain specific metadata standards they will take care of some of the technical things like the access and maybe provide a um, persistent identifier and so on. So that's a good start to submit your data to, uh, to one of the international repositories. And, and this is just a, a sample. Um, so what we talk about when we talk about data management, um, or when we talk about data management, we need to also talk about what is research data. And research data is, of course, all the raw data files that you produce when you do experiments, for example, like uh, images or sequences or other raw data files, but it's also the metadata from your lab books or from the instruments, it's code, it's process data, it's um, legal and ethical permits. Um, so basically it's any information that you use in your research. And we want to adopt a broad definition of what research data is when we talk about data management, because we don't want to miss um, any aspect. So research data um, typically goes through a life cycle. And here it's depicted in a very nice circle with arrows going in a clockwise direction uh, from one phase to the other. And to my experience, at least, that is not the reality. The arrows will go back and forth and a little bit all over the place. But let's start at the top anyway. So um, usually a project starts with a planning phase where you think about what data you need to use. Maybe you can reuse existing data, your own or already published data. 
or you go directly to um, the phase of data generation. When you have the data that you need, um, you move on to study it and do some analysis. Maybe you collaborate with others, so you have some file sharing to do and you have to store your data in the short term. And when you're no longer actively working with your data, it moves into long-term storage. And hopefully then it will also reach the phase of data publishing and reuse. And um, at each phase of the life cycle, data needs to be handled in different ways. And this is where data management comes in. Uh, it's needed throughout the life cycle, but the needs might differ. And data management is really an umbrella term covering all aspects of the um, data life cycle. And to me, at least the purpose of data management is to make the research process as efficient as possible. So it covers topics for dealing with data on a day-to-day -day basis, like organizing the data, structuring it, storing it, backing up, um, and so on. But also long-term issues for preservation and sharing your data. And we should also be compliant and consider ethical and legal um, considerations. And I'm sure that all of you are already working with data management in one way or the other already, even if you might not think about it. But uh, one of the keys to good data management is planning ahead. And it's a little bit of an investment. So it takes some time at the beginning, but it will save a lot of time uh, in the long run. So when you should, there's quite a few things to, to think about and to make sure that you actually think about all the necessary aspects, it's a good way to make use of a data management plan. And the data management plan is a revisable document that describes what uh, researchers plan to do with both new and existing data. And it should um, explain all the steps before, during, and after a project. And I want to come back to the first point that it should be a revisable document. And with that, I mean that you should, during the project, you should go back to it and you should maybe update it if new data is added to your project, or you can also use it as a guide. And um, many people don't, I mean, the first time they create a data management plan is probably when it's mandated by someone. And this is becoming more and more common that funding agencies or institutions or maybe computing infrastructure is asking you to provide a data management plan. And people might just see it as another administrative burden. But if you use it in, a, it can be used in a very useful way. So, a data management plan is usually created by answering questions. And these questions um, might come from a template that someone did or um, from a tool, a data management plan tool. And if it's used correctly and it asks you relevant questions uh, that helps you to be prepared during the research project, and if you provide detailed and practically focused answers and you come back to it from time to time, it's gonna be very useful. So I'm gonna, sorry. I'm gonna show you um, an example of what a data management plan 
can uh, entail. So there are uh, usually different sections that uh, can, it looks a little bit different depending on who the stakeholder is that asks for the data management plan or who prepared it. But these are some general chapters. So first we have description of data. What type of data will be generated or will you use existing data? And what are what, from which samples um, is this data generated? And then there are questions about documentation and data quality. How will analysis be documented? Do you have a versioning strategy? What's the metadata standards that will be used? And there's also questions about storage and, and backup. What are the backup systems in place? What's the estimated size of the data? Do you need to restrict access to data? Which leads us also to the next section about legal and ethical aspects. And this will be particularly important if you work with um, sensitive human data, but also it might be um, asking if you have authorizations to work with animals or if there are agreements in place with other stakeholders and so on. And there is also one chapter about accessibility and long-term storage where you will answer uh, questions about how data will be shared and where it will be stored long-term. So, as I mentioned, there are tools that can help you create the data management plan. And I have here an example of two tools. One is DMP Online, which is commonly used. And the one we use at SciLife Lab is uh, Data Stewardship Wizard. And what is great with tools is that we can, from the data steward, um, Point, we can actually go in and create customized templates or questionnaires for the researchers that where we select the questions that they should answer, but also we can in, provide integrated guidelines um, and try to provide information to make it much easier for the researchers to answer the questions. Because the difficult part here is not to find questions to answer, but to find answers to the questions. And a part of my job is to um, provide these guidelines in different uh, places. So one is this tool, and there are also other uh, forums for, for providing guidelines. And earlier this year, I was involved in creating some minimal guidelines about data management for the NF core community. So this is on the, they can be found under the usage menu uh, on the NF core website. So have a look there if you haven't done so already. And they are focusing a little bit on the aspects of computational resources and data sharing. And data sharing is a good way, as I already said, to, to start making your data fair. It's also something that I'm passionate about uh, and like to promote. And therefore, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that right now. And it's also a great entry point, sort of, into working more actively with data management. So I, um, what, when I prepared this presentation, I wasn't sure where to start when talking about data sharing. So I actually did sort of a little data sharing exercise that I thought that you could do um, later on. And we will just sort of go through what I think would be useful steps. 
So um, select a data set or a project that you're working on. And maybe this could also actually be a pipeline and you think about the output from your favorite NF core pipeline and what data type uh, that would, would generate. And then you, the first step, once you know what the data set you're working on with and that you want to, to publish, then you identify a suitable repository. And then you check the repository guidelines for different things. So file formats, what are the file formats that they um, want you to submit, both for raw data, but also for process data. And then you have a look at the metadata that they require or recommend. And do they also recommend vocabularies to provide values for the metadata fields that they have? Do they have any guidelines about quality measures? Um, or is there any file validation tools? And also, it's good to look at uh, licensing guidelines. Is, do you have to choose a license yourself or is there a license for the repository that is automatically added if you use that repository? So when you have found all the guidelines, then you need to prepare your data to conform to the repository guidelines. So for example, maybe you have um, aligned BAM files, but they want you to provide FASTQ files and then you have to convert them. Or for the process data, maybe you want to publish some sort of a matrix file, which is in Excel format, but you need to export it to a CSV file or a TSV file um, and so on. And then once your data is ready and prepared, it's time to submit your data. And I actually included this step in the exercise because I think you should do it, even if it's just an exercise. Um, and in general, I recommend to uh, publish your data or yeah, publish your data as early as possible in the project. And there are several benefits of doing so. It's much easier to provide metadata when you're closer to the data. You remember what you did. If you have collaborators, they might still be around. Or if you used, um, uh, if someone else produced your data, they might uh, not have provided you with all the metadata needed. So you need to go back to them and ask uh, what what exactly what machine was used to generate the data, for example. And it's really nice if this is done early and not when your final version of your paper is accepted, because then it can get a little bit stressful and uh, delay your publication, especially if the repository is a curated one. Then it might take several weeks before uh, the data can be uh, made public. On top of this, you also get a backup in a different location, which is something we recommend anyway. And publishing your data will increase your citations. And if you do it early, people have more time to cite you. Some counter arguments might be that, how can I submit my data this early? I, I haven't analyzed it. But you can submit your raw data and then process data can be linked later. Another uh, concern might be that you can get scooped. And if this is a concern to you, most repositories actually um, use, allow you to use embargo if that's necessary. So maybe not this week, but, uh, or maybe, but at some point when you feel motivated, 
I think you should go through uh, these steps. And to help you get started a little bit, uh, I want to show you a flowchart of how you can think when you want to identify a suitable repository. And there are also on in the data management guidelines on the NFCore website, there's also links to um, uh, wizards that help you choose and, and other guidelines that are very more specific. So first thing to, to ask yourself is if the data contain personal or sensitive information, because then you need to choose a controlled access repository. And one example of this is the European Genome Phenome Archive, the EGA. But if not, um, we want to choose a discipline specific repository if one exists. And it's just because it's easier for people to, to find it. And one thing to think about though, is that the repository also needs to be sustainable. So it might be worthwhile avoiding very small uh, repositories that is maintained by a research group or a small consortium because it's quite likely that they will um, run out of funding or not be maintained for another reason and your data will uh, disappear from the public domain at least. Uh, so this discipline specific repositories is highly recommended, but if there are none, um, then maybe your institution has a repository where you, which you can use or uh, your sort of last resort is to go to a general repository like Figshare or Sonodo or UDAT. So now let's say we have picked uh, our repository. And for this example, we will look at the ENA. So now we want to look at their guidelines and we're not gonna go through all of them, but uh, I have an example here of metadata fields um, when you submit raw reads to ENA. So there are different things that you have to submit to ENA, different metadata objects or, or data objects. Uh, but this is just one example. So they have listed 11 uh, fields. So what the field is called in this short description. And then for some of them, they also have listed permitted values. And that is, um, and the reason for that is that uh, they don't want you to just write whatever you call the platform or the instrument that you use, but to actually stick to, to a list of values to make it interoperable and also uh, easier for uh, to be ma machine readable. So this is for the library source, for example. You can choose between genomic, genomic single cell, transcriptomic, and so on. So this is good because then you know um, makes it easier to actually fill in the metadata field if you know which values you can choose from. Um, so I hope that at least some of you will go through this data sharing exercise later on, but there are also uh, I also included some a slide from uh, my colleague, Niklas, who uh, has a longer talk uh, or lectures about life science data management that can be found um, on this link. And you can listen to them to get more information in depth. But uh, I wanted to just share the take home messages from here. So consider doing a data management plan for your project. 
and I hope I have already uh, explained that enough. And plan for submitting raw data to public repositories as early as possible. Organize project metadata from the start. So for example, if you have to provide um, species in your metadata, um, and then it's good to, to not just call it mouse maybe, but you can actually call it the scientific name or whatever uh, vocabulary that the repository that you're gonna submit to uh, requires. And pick a thought through file and folder structure organization for your computational analysis. This is also something that really helps you in the long run to, to set up a structure and then stick to it. And there are many, many um, ways of doing this, but, and there are also many recommendations out there. And strive for reproducibility, both for data and code, and be aware that there are legal aspects to processing human data. And you can also read more about that uh, and find some links in the, on the NFCore website. And also ask for help if you need it. So you are not the only person thinking about these problems. And at your institute, or different institutions might handle this in different ways. It might be the library um, that is dealing with data management questions. It can be a data office, or maybe it's even the IT department. So look around and ask for help if you need it. You're also very welcome to reach out to me and to my colleagues. And I want to thank you for listening. And before we move on to, to the Q&A session, uh, I, I hope I've already inspired you a little bit to dig deeper into data management. And I want to share just sort of a final motivational quote by Rachel Ainsworth. She's an astrophysicist at the University of Manchester. Your primary collaborator is yourself six months from now, and your past self doesn't answer emails. And I think that is quite to the point. Thank you. So thank you very much, Ellen, for this interesting talk. As, um, as a bioinformatics core facility here at Cubic, this topic really touches us closely. Uh, we do need to share our data with um, with with public repositories and and do data management plans not only for our own data but also for collaborators so that was very interesting to see your take on that and and we do have one question from the audience and it goes more in the direction of um what can we do with nfco pipelines so phil asks are there any data management plan tools or formats that nfco pipelines could somehow adhere into Sorry, I, I lost my connection somehow. Oh, don't worry about it. If you want, I can repeat the question. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So, so Phil asks if there are any data management plan tools or formats that the NFCore pipelines could adhere to, 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 make, to make it easier um, also to, uh, to, to follow the FAIR principles? Um, maybe not tools, but uh, I, one thing that I was thinking about is at least to make some, uh, yeah, I think it would be really awesome if for each pipeline, it, there would be recommendation about repositories, for example. Uh, and then, if then there could also be recommendations about metadata and standards. 
and and file formats and so on and to make sure sort of that it's probably already the case that the pipelines produce the right file formats i would guess but that is something that one could um look at yes thank you that's something that we will really consider for for our pipelines 